music is such a wonder, isn't it? I'm telling you, you guys do such a great job. What a blessing to just hear you night after night and to sing with you. I, I, have, a, I have a special love for music because my first access point to Jesus was through, through music in a very unexpected way. I encountered my first spiritual ideas in uh, the lyrics of the rock band Led Zeppelin. <laughs> And you're thinking, how could that possibly be positive? Well, for me, it, it was positive because I thought that all of religion was, was fiction. I thought it was all in the category of myth, um, on the level of the Greek myths and every other ancient story that everybody was telling. Maybe even on the level of Jane Austen. I don't know. I just thought it was old and it was fiction. And in the lyrics of, of 1970s rock, I encountered this idea that there was a spiritual warfare going on. And in the lyrics of Led Zeppelin, uh, Jesus was mentioned. The dragon from the dark was mentioned. I thought, fiction, fiction, more fiction. And, uh, and then we were, my girlfriend and I were introduced to Revelation chapter 12, speaking of the dragon and his fall, etc. I thought, oh, maybe there's something to this. So, like it or not, I'm here because of Led Zeppelin. You can do what you want with it. Now, music has a very special place in my heart on another level. Um, it, it's, such a, it's such a beautiful thing to hear and to process um, any aspect of reality through the medium of music. I read a philosopher years ago who was an atheist, maybe more of an agnostic, and he was moving through all the intellectual, rational proofs for the existence of God, trying to, trying to discover whether or not there was a reason he ought to believe in God. So he moved through the teleological argument for the existence of God, the cosmological argument. He moved through the, every argument he could find intellectually. And then at the end of this essay, he said none of it persuaded him and just when he was about to give up on the possibility of the existence of a supreme being, he said to himself, if music were the only evidence on the table, I would have to believe. And he went on to explain that there is such a beauty in the formulation of the sounds that compose melodies that he had to conclude that there had to be some kind of order in the universe that approximated to an ultimate beauty. So he associated in his mind beauty with music and came to that conclusion. I think it's fascinating. And if you think about it, what is music? Those who are, I don't know if you guys are classically trained or not, but, but even those who are not classically trained, they know that, that music is a certain something. And those who are classically trained, you'll, as soon as I say it, you'll say, yep, that's right. Music is emotionally rendered math, isn't it? And that's why when we hear beautiful music, it creates a sense of order inside, a reordering of our emotions. It's a beautiful thing. Just love music so much. So thank you uh, for the ministry that you have been here night after night during the day. It's just, it's just a blessing. I would rather do that than this, but I can't do that, so I have to do this. So here we go. Let's pray one more time. Father in heaven, you're incredible in the extreme. God, there's none like you in all the universe. What we do know of you is so attractive and beautiful that we find ourselves drawn to you. And yet we, we sense, Lord, that there are things about you that have escaped our notice. We're here to open up your word, to ponder the mystery of the gospel. We pray that you would that you would reach deep inside of us, Lord, through our intellects into our emotions, that you would captivate our attention tonight, Lord. Help us to see you, to know you, to love you in ways that we never have before. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, I want to begin our time together this, this evening. I'm going to say a word, do a little bit of word play. I'm going to say a word, and if you know what this word means or what it refers to, raise your hand. Now, some of you know me, and you may know, and you're disqualified, maybe Haley, okay? But if you know what this word means, just raise your hand. Here's the word. Are you ready? Get your hand ready. I don't see your hand ready. Get your hand ready. It's going up or it's not going up, one or the other. Okay, here's the word. Raise your hand if you know this word, what it means. Bugatti. 
Okay, keep them up. I don't know, maybe 20, 30 people. You don't know what a Bugatti is. It's not an exotic Italian pasta. I'll tell you that. Okay, look at the screen. Here's a Bugatti. So what is a Bugatti? Well, somebody said a car. No, it's not a car. Do not insult the Bugatti by calling it a car. This is not a mere car. This is a very, very highly engineered driving machine. Now, the Bugatti is astounding. I don't know who holds or which automobile currently holds the world record, but this, the Bugatti was the fastest street legal car on earth uh, for a period of time. I don't know if that still holds that title or not. There's some dude here who knows. I don't know, but it topped out at 408 kilometers per hour on the highway. Now, the Bugatti, if you want one, it's $2 million. $2.2 million if you want, you know, some amenities like air conditioning or something, I guess. I don't know. $2 million. Now, the Bugatti, at top speed, with a full tank of fuel, will be out of fuel in 12 minutes. Which is really fortunate for you if you owned one because the tires will be dangerously bald at 14 minutes at top speed. And when you need to replace the tires, a set of four is $45,000. It's a steal <laughs> when you paid $2 million for your automobile. It's an astounding piece of engineering, the Bugatti is. Now, I happen to know a person who owns one of these. They're all numbered. There are very few of them in existence. You have to order it way ahead of time, and they only make so many. And I happen to know somebody who owns one of these. Now, I didn't always know him. I was in an event like this, and one of my friends came up to me, and he said, hey, I heard that you're going to Europe. You're going to do some evangelistic meetings or something. Or I said, yeah. He said, are you aware that we have a brother over there who has a Bugatti? I mean, he was like that. He was just so excited. We have a brother over there who has a Bugatti. I said, no, you're kidding me. What's a Bugatti? I didn't know. <laughs> I had a Prius. <laughs> I was like, what's a Bugatti? Okay, and it was this photo that he pulled up on his phone and he showed me. He said, this is a, Buga a Bugatti. It's the fastest street legal car on earth. Now, when you have a Prius <laughs> and you discover that there is a Seventh-day Adventist on planet earth that has a Bugatti, naturally, you want to drive it. So I said to my friend who told me about it, I said, there's a Seventh-day Adventist who owns one of those as he showed it to me on his phone. He said, yeah. And I said, and I'm going where he lives? And he said, yeah. I said, I will drive that car. He said, no, no, no. No, the word through the Adventist grapevine is nobody drives the Bugatti but the brother himself. I said, listen very carefully to me. If there's a Seventh-day Adventist on planet Earth, that owns the fastest street legal car on earth, and it's a Bugatti, and I'm going to be anywhere near where he lives, I will drive that car. So we made a $10,000 bet. $10,000 on his side that he would donate to my ministry, and I would give him a dollar if I lost. He said, you're not driving it. He won't even let his wife drive it. I said, I'm not his wife. <laughs> and I'm driving that car. So I arrive with my wife, and uh, we're there, and I do the first opening session, then night two, then night three, and here comes this man and this woman, and they come and they say, hey, uh, we'd like to have you out to our place for lunch, and I'm thinking in my mind, this is him, this is him, I know this is him. Somehow, I just could sense it, you know? That feeling you get when you know the brother that owns the Bugatti is standing right in front of you, that feeling, I had that feeling. And as he said, would you like to come out for lunch? Uh, I said, well, let me think about that for him. Sure, yeah. Yeah, we'll come. When, where, we got the address. We went out to his house. And uh, we sat there eating whatever we were eating. And they just had a new baby boy. They were so excited. We finished eating. They were just showing us their baby. Look at our baby. Our baby's awesome. Oh, our baby's incredible. I was like, oh, what a beautiful baby. You have such a nice baby. Where's the Bugatti, dude? <laughs> <laughs> so he took us outside, he pushed a button, and a garage door opened, and there was a Porsche, 
I said, that's not it. I've seen the pictures. He pushed another button, a second garage door opened. There was a Rolls Royce. He pushed another button, the garage do third garage door opened, and there was a Lamborghini. I was about to call this brother to repentance on the spot. <laughs> but I thought I want to drive the Bugatti. So he pushed one more button and the garage door opened and there it was, the Bugatti. He said, do you want me to pull it out so you can see it? I said, yes, please do. So he pulled it out onto the driveway and we, from every angle, looking at this work of art and wow, this is something. He said, oh, it really is something. I said, hey brother, um, could I drive the Bugatti? And he said, no, no, you can't. Nobody's driven it but me. I said, seriously, I can't drive it. He said, no, 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 you can't drive the Bugatti. I said, are you a Seventh-day Adventist? <laughs> he said, yeah, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. What does that got to do with the Bugatti? I said, well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist too. You're a Seventh-day Adventist? I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. He said, yeah. I said, are you a Bible-believing Seventh-day Adventist? <laughs> he said, yes. <laughs> I said, have you read Acts chapter 2? <laughs> he said, I have. I can't right this moment remember what it says, but I've read the whole Bible, so I've read Acts chapter 2. I said, well, Acts chapter 2 says of all the possessions of the saints that they had all things common. <laughs> so, brother, the truth is your Bugatti is my Bugatti, <laughs> and I don't see any reason why I can't drive our Bugatti. He said, no, you're not driving it. <laughs> I said, listen, if you let me drive the Bugatti, I will use the experience in a sermon, illustration. People will be drawn to the Lord. You didn't expect that with your Bugatti. He said, really? You'll use it as a sermon illustration? I said, yes. He said, okay, you can drive it. It was that simple. <laughs> I was just like, wow, why did I go to all this trouble trying, all I had to... Because this brother was evangelistically oriented. And then I realized as I'm standing there that the whole time my wife was right there standing to my side, slightly back, saying, oh, do not let my husband drive the Bugatti. And I said something to my wife that I have never said before that or since. I don't know where it came from, some deep, deep, dark place. I said with a wave of my hand, I said, silence, woman. I said that. And that was right before the San Antonio vote. Some of you know what that means. The rest of you are like, what? Okay, so there we were. Man, the repentance was deep later. But I got to drive the Bugatti. So me and the brother, we jumped in the Bugatti. He thinks it's his, so he drove it first. And we took off off of his property. We went to a long straightaway on a country road. And he said, are you ready? I said, I was born ready and he floored it. And we went so fast, so fast. Do you know what I mean by that? We picked up speed so quickly that I felt G-force. My body just was just pulled back into that seat. It was the perfect combination of terror and fun. <laughs> and then he slowed down, he pulled over, he said, it's your turn. I said, yes, it is. <laughs> he stepped out of the driver's side, we switched sides. I got in the driver's seat. I said, put your seatbelt on, bro. He put his seatbelt on. He said, it's very strange over here. I've never been in the passenger seat of this car. I said, get ready. We started driving. We picked up speed. I looked to him at one point and said, I guess I need your permission because you think it's yours. <laughs> he said, do it. And I floored it. And it was so fun. I can never, ever listen. Listen, I'm hoping there will be Bugattis in the new heavens and the new earth. I have a hunch there will not be, but that would just really top it off for me. This was a great experience. Now, as we're driving back to the house, I said, should we stop at the petrol station and fill it up? He said, oh, no, no, no. You can't put regular normal fuel in this car. It's very highly engineered. So I have to import the fuel from France. And I have a lot of it back at the property. Special high-octane fuel. 
of some kind. Now, what I want to share with you this evening is that the Bugatti is a particular kind of thing. It's a type of engineered device. And I'm going to suggest to you that you and I, as human beings, are very specifically designed to operate on a very specific kind of high-octane fuel that is the thing we need more than any other thing in order to thrive and flourish as human beings on all levels. Now, I'm going to access this idea with the Apostle Paul's help because what I'm going to share with you right now on the screen in Galatians chapter 5 is Paul at the very height of his theological powers. This is Paul in the course of just a few words achieving a level of clarity that is extraordinary. So Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 5, track with it here, he says, For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. Now it's that term righteousness by faith that I want to ask you to have an interest in right now. Righteousness by faith. This is the only time the term occurs in all of Scripture. The concept is replete through Scripture, but this is the only time where the term, as a complete term, righteousness by faith occurs. You read of justification by faith, salvation by grace through faith, but this is the only place where this particular term occurs, righteousness by faith. Now, I want you to notice something about righteousness by faith. Righteousness by faith is something that we eagerly long for by the deliberate stimuli of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's goal, job, pursuit is to awaken inside of you and me an eager desire for this thing that Paul is calling righteousness by faith. Now, the second thing we want to notice in the text is this word righteousness. Righteousness is a biblical word that really doesn't mean the kind of standard of moralism that we normally associate it with. It has nothing to do with whether you ate cheese or not at the potluck. It has nothing to do with the modesty of your clothing, pro or con. That's not to say that your body needs or your artery needs, arteries need more cheese, nor is it to say that, that modesty isn't a good thing. It's just to say that's not what this word's talking about. This word is talking about the relational dynamic of love between human beings. You and I, each of us, giving preferential treatment to the other. That's what the word means coming to us from the Old Testament. Righteousness is a word that describes a relational dynamic. Now, it's so high, this standard, that it is beyond our capacity to achieve it if left to ourselves. So righteousness is by means of Another dynamic. Righteousness isn't something that you and I, by, by trying hard enough, can conjure up. In, you can't manufacture it. Jesus got to this point when he said, for example, which one of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? It's a rhetorical question. The obviously implied answer is you can't. You can't think hard enough to get taller. Righteousness is not achievable by willpower. The standard is so high because the standard is basically perfect, other-centered love. Now, you and I can give a semblance of, a pretense of righteousness by mastering a few outward behaviors that we regard as high moral standards. But we can be as dark as the devil's dark heart inside while performing those externally modulated actions. So righteousness is a very high standard. When Jesus says, which one of you by taking thought can add one cubit to a stature, the, the implication is you just can't do it. And then he says, which one of you by, by, by trying hard enough, you, you who are evil, you, you cannot be good by just trying hard enough. That's his point. It would be like me saying, I have, I have a Bugatti here this evening, and I'm going to give it to you. It's yours. You can have it. All you have to do is jump and touch the ceiling once. How many of you would actually stand up and start jumping? Just a few very materialistic teenage boys. <laughs> Nobody else would even attempt it. Because you know it's within the realm of, it's, it's outside of the realm of possibility. So righteousness can't be the focus. Righteousness is by faith. Now, faith is a universal faculty. 
that every human being possesses. Whether that faith is active or not is another question, but it's like imagination or memory. It's like the rational faculty of deduction from cause to effect. Everybody has faith. It's there, like a sleeping giant of possibility residing in the human being, but it's dormant, it's inactive. And so Paul goes on and he says, listen, Righteousness is by faith, but then in the next verse he says, for in Christ Jesus, neither this nor that avails anything but faith working through love. Now, the blanks there are circumcision or uncircumcision. I've taken them out because it's, that's not an issue that we're debating. It's not something that we're considering. I'm going to suggest to you that that was just the hot button issue of that time. And so that's what Paul was addressing. But the statement remains true no matter what you put in the blanks. Literally, you could put anything there. And in Jesus Christ, neither Sabbath keeping nor Sunday keeping. Put whatever you want there. Doesn't avail for salvation. Righteousness is not achieved by any other means than faith that is working through love. This is the point that Paul is making. So the word working here is fascinating. It's the word energio or energeo in the Greek from which we get the English word energy or energize. Literally, Paul's equation is that righteousness is by faith, and faith is energized, it's empowered, it's actuated, it's brought into action by contact with God's love. God's love is the love that is brought to our attention here. Some modern translations have tried to make this out to be that righteousness is by faith and faith works by my love. So if I can conjure up love, my faith will be activated and achieve righteousness. But Paul is saying to us that righteousness is achieved by faith and faith, that sleeping giant of potential, is awakened to action when it comes into vital contact with a love that is not naturally in me toward God, but is in God toward me. And his love then becomes a creative force that wakes something up inside of me that has been asleep all along, and that is faith, by which righteousness becomes a possibility. So on one occasion, for those of you who are familiar with, with Ellen White, she was receiving a lot of letters. People were saying, hey, what is this righteousness by faith thing that people are talking about? This was shortly after the year 1888, which would be significant for some of you here who are aware of that significant year in Adventist history. So she was getting these letters. Hey, what is righteousness by faith? What is it? What is it? She didn't give so much a theological answer. She wrote back and she said, okay, I'll tell you what it is. It is the active principle of love imparted by the Holy Spirit. Righteousness by faith is the active principle of love imparted by the Holy Spirit. It's not something I conjure up, it's not something I produce, it's not something I manufacture. You don't need to try harder. You need to have an encounter with the love of God that supersedes everything that is wrong in your life. You need to see the love of God for you as a constant, as something that in no way can be altered by your behavior. Now, just short of that, we're all pagans, religiously. To the degree that I believe that God is activated toward me by what I do, I am essentially fundamentally pagan in my religious orientation, and the gospel is compromised in my thinking. The only way the gospel has integrity is if God's love is paramount and precedes anything that is rectified in me. And the moment I realize that I am perfectly loved by God, regardless of my condition, in that moment, I begin to wake up to the reality 
that I am the object of God's desire, his passion, his interest, and I then begin to return to him, not because it's in me to return to him, to rectify anything, but because his love becomes the fuel, the force, the petrol in my system as a human being, psychologically, emotionally, relationally, that alters everything. So there's a sense in which righteousness by faith is the answer to the question, what is a human being? Or more specifically, righteousness by faith is the answer to the question, what is the fundamental power, the fuel that, that drives human flourishing? Righteousness by faith, that is the gospel, is answering that question. Let me just peel back the layers on this for you. I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Dean Ornish. He came to fame because of studies he did that proved that you could return, re reverse heart disease um, by basically eating actual food and moving your body. And he brought all this data to the, to the table and became famous. But, but then he published a book that was apparently outside of his area of scientific interest. And he went on record as saying, well, actually, I've been collecting this data for over 20 years regarding the emotional heart and the power of intimacy to impact biological health. And Dr. Ornish published a book that went straight to the top of the New York Times bestseller list. And the title alone is pretty provocative, Love and Survival. And he's suggesting in his research and in this book that there is a direct correlation between human flourishing and the real-time experience of love in human relations. I don't know if you can see the subtitle of the book, but the subtitle is The Scientific Basis for the Healing Power of Intimacy. And in this book, he basically builds on this thesis. He says, anything, this is quoting Dr. Ornish, anything that promotes feelings of love, note the language carefully, this is fascinating, anything that promotes feelings of love and intimacy is healing. Now, he's not a believer as far as I can tell, and he's not trying to preach anything. He's simply looking at scientific data, and he's saying that anything that promotes feelings of love is healing. And with the word healing, he means primarily uh, biologically healing, that, that the body itself, that the physical health is impacted by love. He goes on and he says, anything that promotes isolation, separation, loneliness, loss, hostility, anger, cynicism, depression, alienation, and related feelings often leads to suffering, disease, and premature death from all causes. Now, those of you who are in the medical profession, you understand his language here when he talks about premature death from all causes. He goes on to explain that every human being has genetic markers from their, their upbringing, from their, from their family history. So when you go to the doctor for the first time, and this is a new doctor, they're gonna say, I want your family history. Why do they want your family history? Because you're predisposed, more likely to die of one thing than another. And he's saying that, that anything that promotes feelings of love and, and intimacy, anything on the other hand that promotes feelings of alienation and, and anger and loss and hostility, that these two sets of emotions impact biological health and anyone who experiences a, a constant atmosphere climate of life in which these types of things, anger, loss, hostility, alienation are present, is more likely to die of whatever it is that they are most predisposed to die of. He goes on in the book to basically demonstrate, and this is fascinating to me, that if you and I have never met, let's just say that this is, this is our first encounter, you know, we've never seen each other, and I walk up to you and I say, hi, my name's Ty, and we shake hands. When we get eye contact, if you subconsciously, in that second that we have, if you sense acceptance in my eyes rather than some kind of hostility or, or I'm not looking past you, I'm looking straight at you, the moment we have skin-on-skin -skin contact in that simple act of shaking hands, right, and I say hello, you say hello, we have that little moment of human contact. Your white blood cell count goes up, and so does mine. You were gonna get the flu moments ago, but now I've just healed you. Yeah. Well, it's just incremental. I mean, not very many white blood cells. 
in that one, but imagine a string of similar relational dynamics. What if you're the kind of person, you have the kind of life in which you wake up to pleasant personalities who actually like you? What if you live in a social climate in which there are all kinds of smiles and eye contact? Your white blood cell count is just going up, 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 up all the time. This is what he demonstrates study after study after study. He actually shows in the book that if people who get older and older and then they go to live in, what do they call them? Uh, what do they call, what's the kind way of? <laughs> Rest homes, okay. Um, is that what you call them here? Rest homes, okay. That, that, that all they did was say, okay, this group of elderly men are just gonna receive the normal run-of-the-mill care that they receive in a facility like this. They're gonna wake up and go through their day and their meals are gonna be served to them in the you know, common meal area. They're just gonna, and then they're gonna just do something different with these, th this controlled group. They're just gonna send in a bunch of little kids to play checkers with them two or three times a week. And the survival rate, longevity, increased by just having little kids drop by and play checkers. It's astounding if you think about it. Well, Ornish goes on and he says, the scientific evidence leaves little doubt that love and intimacy are powerful determinants of our health and survival. Again, he's not preaching anything. He never quotes the Bible. And then he says this, why they have such an impact remains somewhat a mystery. It's a mystery, he says, because he's operating on the premise of Darwinian evolution, survival of the fittest, and in that paradigm of reality, in that worldview, right, the highest law is self-preservation, not altruistic love. So you would think the white blood cell count would go up every time you punch someone or pass them on the freeway and shout angry words at them. But no, the white blood cell co count goes up when you actually choose to do what is best and right for the other over yourself. It's astounding. So he says it's a mystery. The remainder of the book is devoted to Dr. Ornish going around the world and interviewing 22 experts in various fields of science, asking them one question. My discoveries, he says to all these 22 experts, my scientific research is showing that human beings are more likely to flourish and resist physical disease when they have relationships of intimacy and love, why are we like this? All 22 experts around the world said things, paragraph longs, and came to the conclusion, we don't know. We have no idea, we shouldn't be like this, but we are. Well, the research essentially says this, that human beings, malfunction psychologically, emotionally, and even biologically when they live in an emotional state and in social states where there are things like racism and loneliness and isolation, envy, greed, hate, and anger. All of these things have something in common. They are self-centered orientations. There is what we might call the optimization of the human being and the human being is optimized biologically, physically, when they experience things like generosity, acceptance, kindness, forgiveness, loyalty, faithfulness, and giving. All of these things have something in common. They're oriented toward the other and what is best for the other. Literally, the, the, the science is revealing that, for example, I'm going to say this rather crudely, but if you have a lot of stuff, you're well off in a material sense. You have money and things. Science, not theology, science has demonstrated if you have a lot of stuff and you just take some of your stuff and you give it to people who don't have stuff, you're increasing your biological health and your survival as a human being. You will live longer by giving away stuff. It's astounding. We're literally psychologically, emotionally, socially, biologically wired for love on all levels as human beings. And the studies have revealed that to the degree that a person who lives in a social climate where there's racism and loneliness, isolation, anger, all these things, the moment they extract themselves from those toxic 
environments and begin build a, a new social circle in which they experience generosity and love and acceptance and forgiveness, that their, their biology, their physiology follows and increases in the capacity for them to sustain life and to flourish as a human being. So what I'm suggesting to you is that righteousness by faith, this theological thing that we're familiar with in Scripture, if analyzed with a broader frame of reference, taking into consideration what we know about psychology and, and sociology, I'm suggesting to you that righteousness by faith is the highest form of healing psychology. And what I'm going to, to attempt to show you now from Scripture is that this high form of healing psychology is grounded in the fact that righteousness by faith, listen, this is really crucial for where we're going to go tonight. Righteousness by faith is a relational dynamic, if it's anything else. It's not just a, a legal rearrangement in the books of heaven. It's an actual way that God relates to us as human beings that generates a response from the human being. So what kind of relational dynamic is this? We'll approach the subject with Paul in Romans, chapter 4 in verse 17. Very simple but very odd statement. He says in Romans, chapter 4, that God calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Now, now what is that? When you and I say something as if it is when it's not, that's called lying, right? Don't do it. Okay, but God calls those things which do not exist as though they, they do exist. The, the context here is Abraham, and the context here is righteousness. When it says God calls those things which do not exist as though they do, the scripture is saying that God calls or relates to me as if I'm righteous when he knows I'm not. God's not blind to the reality of my situation. He wasn't blind to the reality of Abraham's situation. But he called, he related, he regarded Abraham as righteous, even though Abraham was not, in fact, righteous. He calls us innocent even though he knows we're guilty. Now, why would God do this? In order to condone unrighteousness? In order to solidify us in our guilt? No, it's a way of relating. It's a relational dynamic that has an effect on our self-perception. I mean, think about it this way. If, if, if you're a parent and you're raising a child, and your little boy is now all of four years old, and you give him a chore to do. And what he's going to do is he's going to sweep the kitchen floor this evening after all the festivities of dinner and company and people have been there. And, and his chore is to sweep the floor. He's so excited. He sweeps the floor. If you come after him, snatch the broom out of his hand with a little bit of an attitude and say, I told you to sweep the floor. What kind of job is this? Can't you do anything right? And then you demonstrate and you sweep the floor and you show him how it's done. Now, he thought he did a good job and you've just communicated to him that he didn't. Now, the next time the floor needs to be swept, what is happening with his motivation level? Hey, do you want to sweep the floor? What's his natural inclination at this point? Ah, uh, no, daddy, you sweep the floor. You're really good at it. I'm not. He's afraid to even try. The shame and the guilt that is imposed on him for failing to meet the mark, for feeling, failing to achieve, right? That feeling inside of him becomes the cycle of his future defeat. On the other hand, if he sweeps the floor and you see that, you know, you're an adult, you have clear vision of the floor. You see that he didn't do that great of a job. He did what he thinks. And you say, wow, you're, you're amazing. You're the best sweeper in the universe. What? Man, you are so good at this. Thank you. What happens in that child 
in that moment. His motivation rises to your vision. So there's a sense in which God relates to us. I'm going to say it this way. This, this may or may not make sense, but let me flesh it out. God relates to us prophetically. He prophesies righteousness and innocence over us in order to make it a reality. Now, it's not a reality in the moment. But Paul goes on to develop his righteousness by faith idea. And he says, okay, God is relating to you as if you're righteous when in fact you're not, as if you're innocent when in fact you're guilty. Now, later on in chapter 6, he says, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What does it mean to reckon? It means to regard, to consider. So Paul is literally saying, you should begin to think of yourself as dead to sin and alive to God. Allow your, your praise to God to be chal- channeled in the direction of what you know his vision is for you. In other words, take on an atmosphere of praise and gratitude and thanks. Not groveling, God, please, please forgive me for the fourth day in a row for the thing you asked him to forgive you for for four days ago. When my wife Sue and I first got married, man, I brought her to tears, I remember, on this particular occasion, and I apologized like a week straight. And finally, she looked at me as I was apologizing again, and she said, that was yesterday, silly boy. How do you want your eggs? She had already moved on, and that didn't say anything about me. It said something about her. There was forgiveness already in her toward me. I didn't need to conjure it up. I didn't need to grovel. I needed to believe better things of her. And we need to believe better things of God. God already loves you. He already loves me. His forgiveness is a reality that is in him toward me even before I repent. God is fundamentally good already, and there's nothing I can do to make him better than he already is. And if I begin to see God in that light, I can begin to relate to myself in a whole new light. God relates to me according to my potential, not according to my condition. Now, if you question this theological framework from Romans, look at 2 Corinthians. This is one of the most fascinating things you'll ever read in Scripture. The love of Christ compels us. It it, it has an effect. It moves us. The love of Christ compels us because we thus judge or we discern something. That if one died for all, that there's some sense in which all died. When Jesus died on the cross, there was a universal aspect to his atoning death. Jesus died for all, so there's a sense in which, in Christ, all died. In Paul's thinking, for example, in Romans chapter 3, he speaks of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Past tense, accomplished reality. There's a sense in which Jesus is the new man, the representative head of the human race. He's the second Adam, and he has achieved things in himself on our behalf already. So, The love of Christ compels me because I realize, hey, wait a minute. If he died for all, then there's a sense in which all died. Now watch where Paul goes with this premise. And he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Paul is essentially saying that the love of God revealed in Christ breaks the power of sin at the most foundational level, at the level of self-centeredness or the, the, the egocentric orientation that we're all possessed with. He says, he says that when you realize the love of Christ as it is and that it is universal toward all, you, you stop living for yourself and you begin living for him. Something changes deep on the inside. God's love is like a creative force. It, it creates in its image. It it reproduces. We love him, John will say, because he first loved us. God's love is the primary 
reality that gives rise to the secondary reality of my returning love. It produces a reciprocal response inside of me. I don't earn it. There's nothing I can do to get God to love me. God already loves me. Pedal to the metal with all of his love. There's nothing I can do to increase or decrease God's love for me. It just is who he is all the time. And that reality is the premise of the righteousness by faith equation. So love is a creative force. Ellen White says it this way, for those of you who appreciate her writings and familiar with them. I met a, a brother here the other night. I quoted Ellen White and he said, who's that? He's from town. I don't know if he's here tonight. I'm, I'm glad you're here. Welcome. He said, I'm a Catholic and I've never heard anything like this before. And he was just hanging out with us here listening. If you're here tonight, this Ellen White lady, she's a trip, man. She says some amazing things, bro. Listen to this. Love is power. Intellectual and moral strength are involved in this principle and cannot be separated from it, from love. Now watch this. Love cannot live without action and every act increases, strengthens, and extends it and love will gain the victory. Do you hear what she's saying here? Love is, a, is an extremely powerful relational dynamic. If I begin to believe that I am perfectly loved by God, that changes everything. It alters the entire course of my thinking process, my feeling process. It changes the way I see and relate to everybody around me. So Paul continues on in the 2 Corinthians passage, and he says, therefore, the therefore refers back to the love of Christ compels me because I discern that he died for everybody, so there's a sense in which all died. Now watch this. Therefore, on the premise of what happened in Jesus, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. That is, we regard no one according to their natural, fallen, sinful, carnal state. We start to see people and relate to people the way God sees and relates to me. If God regards me as righteous and innocent, even though he knows I'm unrighteous and guilty, if I begin to rest in that level of love and acceptance toward me, it will alter the way I see and relate to others. I will begin to relate to people with a whole different vision of who they are. Let me put it to you this way. The way I see God seeing me, just rest on that for a minute. The way I see God seeing me, how does God see and relate to me, will determine the way I see myself which in turn will take all the hostility and enmity out of me, all the blame-casting impulse out of me, and I will begin to see others and relate to them the way I am seen and related to by God. The gospel runs like this, very simply. The gospel is composed of, first, the objective facts of the gospel. Jesus died not for me as a believer, but for all, according to Paul. His sacrifice was a universal embrace of the entire human race. Paul says, as we just read, he died for all, so there's a sense in which all died in Christ, our representative head. Now check this out. Redemption, salvation, according to Paul's thinking, is an accomplished objective reality. Let me, let me reason this through with you for a moment in a way that may help it to make sense. Hypothetically, if every human being in history said no to Jesus, said no to God, hypothetically, if all of us rejected the sacrifice that was made on our behalf, listen, a human being is already occupying the throne of the universe. Humanity, listen, is, past tense, saved. A specimen of the human race is there already. And his name is Jesus. And he's waiting for our arrival to occupy the throne for eternity with him. So humanity, objectively, something was achieved in Jesus that you and I can't contribute to. You can't, you can't, 
add any new data to the gospel. There aren't additional facts. My faith in him doesn't doesn't make new facts. It just apprehends the facts that are already there in Jesus, which then produces a subjective experiential response. So, So I'm responding to him on the premise of what he's already done for me. The, the, the objective facts of the gospel produce subjective experience. Now, what does this mean practically? Well, just look at the biblical narrative. It's astounding how truly good and wonderful and amazing God is in the way he relates to human beings. Think of Abraham. Abraham is somebody that we regard very highly, and yet the record shows that he was a liar and a coward. And yet he was the man God chose to work through in order to generate the lineage through which Messiah would come. He was a friend of God. He was the person to whom God went and and entered into that very interesting dickering process from 50 to 40 to 30 down to 10 regarding Sodom and Gomorrah. This is Abraham. Abraham. What about Isaac? Isaac was a dysfunctional father. You wouldn't let him babysit your children. You'd just find somebody else. And yet he's one of the stars of the story of Scripture. What about Moses? What about Jacob? Jacob was a manipulator and a thief. I mean, I don't want to bring these guys down in your estimation, but I didn't write the Bible. This is the narrative of these individuals. There's Moses, who was a murderer turned coward, and he ran. There's David, who was a murderer and an adulterer, and adulterer is a kind word here. The power differential between him and Bathsheba was so immense that it was more like rape. This is David, the man after God's own heart. There's Peter, who was just a loudmouth hothead who said everything that popped into his noggin. So much so that at the transfiguration, God the Father was speaking, Peter interrupted him, and the God of the universe had to say, Peter, listen to Jesus. Stop talking. This is Peter. There's John and James. They were violent street thugs. Sons of thunder, let's burn the city down because they were inhospitable toward Jesus. These are, the, these are the guys that Jesus started the Christian movement with. There's Matthew, the worst of all, a tax collector under the Trump administration. You don't know what that means. I know what that means. Okay. There's Paul, a self-righteous Pharisee and a murderer. And all of us in this room right now, we are all living in the wake of the influence of Paul's missionary endeavors. And God said, he's the one. He's the one I'm, I'm going to use him. And then there's you. Fill in the blank. I don't know you. I don't know what you would put in that blank. But I can tell you this. You're messed up. You're dysfunctional from the word go. You've got problems. I look out and to your faces, and some of you look like you're right on the edge. <laughs> you wake up each morning. You look in the mirror. You get eye contact with a crazy person. There is no telling what you might do the next moment. You are deeply, desperately in need of a savior. And you can't save yourself. You're whatever you are, and it's not a pretty picture. And yet, the testimony of the gospel is that you are perfectly loved. You are, past tense, crucified and risen in Christ, according to the gospel. You are accepted already, without doing anything at all to earn it, you are already accepted in the beloved Christ Jesus. You are forgiven and redeemed, past tense, done deal, you are. This is the positive, prophetic declaration of the gospel. You are, according to Paul, more than a conqueror. Not just a conqueror, but more than a conqueror. You're saying, wow, today didn't feel like that. But in Christ, conquest is your present reality objectively and your subjective future if you keep hanging out with Jesus. 
You are enthroned at the right hand of God, according to the Apostle Paul, in the person of Christ. In other words, you are in Christ what you are not in yourself. And that is such good news. Said another way, you're a Bugatti, baby. <laughs> and you operate by the high-octane fuel of God's love for you, and there's nothing you can do to earn it. He's already there. The good news of the gospel is that God's love for you is a constant. You can't sin your way out of it. Now, if that makes you feel like sinning more with gusto, you need to take a second look at the beauty of Jesus because his love for you is so powerful and transformative that while it produces a response in you and me, that response from us is not meritorious. You are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Hallelujah. The good news is good indeed. Father in heaven, we bring ourselves to you like gutless little Priuses. But Lord, we know that in Christ we are destined to be Bugattis. I pray, Father, that you would flood us mentally, emotionally with a constant, ongoing assurance of your love for us. May we see in Christ everything that you have done, past tense, historically for us and come to the deep abiding realization that there's nothing we can do to earn your love because we already have it. That we can't earn your favor because we already have it. May we rest in that reality. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>